As of right now, we have a little over two months until Shadow of the Erd Tree comes out, and just like many other fans of Elden Ring, I can't wait to see what this DLC will bring to the table. Considering that FromSoft has been cooking it for over two years, this is likely going to end up being one of the most massive expansions to a game ever concocted. And combining that with FromSoft's track record of usually having the best parts of their games take place in the DLCs, my expectations are about as high as they could possibly get. However, being hyped about the DLC made me step back and think about the game in its current state. While Shadow of the Erd Tree is most likely going to bring it to a whole new level, Elden Ring is still Elden Ring. It's a damn fun open world Souls experience, and it's already one of my favorite games directed by Ol Miyazaki. So before this humongous expansion releases, which will probably dominate most people's conversations about the game going forward, I'd like to take one last opportunity to dissect it in its current state. What it does right, what it does wrong, how it compares to the previous Souls games, and maybe a few things I'm hoping the DLC will bring to the table. Plus, it's been over a year since I made an Elden Ring video, so after going a pretty decent chunk of time without talking about the game, I think this is a perfect opportunity to revisit some of my thoughts on it. Now, with that out of the way, let's start by talking about the biggest and most prominent aspect of the game. Considering the gargantuan amount of shit there is to dissect in this game, picking a place to begin is a little daunting. But I figured I'd start by mentioning one of the main reasons why I think it became as popular as it is. The visuals. While this isn't my favorite FromSoft game, I still think it's without a doubt the best looking one. Bloodborne's gothic architecture is great, Sekiro has some really nice color palettes, Dark Souls 3 comes with a few jaw-dropping locations, and Demon's Souls Remake is admittedly the most impressive in terms of graphics. But even after my hundreds of hours put into this game, I'm still taken aback by the visuals every now and then. Due to the massive size of the lands between, FromSoft got the opportunity to make so many different types of locations. A disgusting land plagued by Melania's rot, a castle of magic, a lava fortress, a plateau of land that's lit by the golden grace of the Erd Tree, an underground world with its own sky full of stars, beautiful snowy mountaintops, and even the Lake of Rot looks kinda neat. The developers had a lot of ambition with their art direction, and I think they absolutely killed it in almost every way. The architecture in so many of the buildings and structures structures is just overflowing with detail, and a lot of the time the enemies and bosses within these locations do an amazing job at complementing the environment. While there are obviously way more important aspects of a game than simply how good it looks, it's just so hard to not have an immense amount of appreciation for the awe-inspiring vision and incredible execution that went into this game's aesthetics. Next, let's talk about what I consider to be the strongest aspect of Elden Ring's world. The exploration. From Software has always been known for their ability to create well-hidden secrets, whether it be something simple like an illusory wall leading to a secret room, a shinobi shortcut taking you back to a previous area, or even a giant-ass lake of ash casually hidden beneath the entire map. While their previous games were already insanely good at this, I think Elden Ring has taken the gold medal as their new king of exploration. Whether it be in the open world or within the legacy dungeons, their ability to create so many secret paths hidden in plain sight is mind-blowing. And obviously, one of the main things that gives this game an edge is the ability to jump. Aside from Sekiro, none of their past games had this feature, which is fine since they still worked great as they were. But giving us that tiny extra bit of mobility allowed them to make the level so much more immersive. I think Stormvale Castle is where a lot of us realized just how much it adds to the experience. There's like a hundred different ways you can tackle that place. Aside from the smaller details, the lands between as a whole is also just damn well put together. This is easily the largest game that FromSoft has developed so far, and in a lot of ways, I think they did a great job at utilizing it. Due to this game having the philosophy of letting you go wherever the hell you want from the beginning, it gives the player a level of freedom 
freedom that is unrivaled by any of their previous titles. As long as you're willing to switch up your playstyle and try out different strategies, each playthrough of this game can feel vastly different from one another. Now, for a lot of other Souls veterans, Elden Ring's world falls completely flat. I've seen countless arguments from Elden haters saying that the game is too bloated and open, making it feel sort of pointless in comparison to the more focused approach of the other games. And while that is a fair argument, I personally disagree. Yes, all of the other Souls games do a better job at perfectly holding your attention on replay. They usually have just the right amount of space between notable locations or genuinely threatening boss fights. But the reason why Elden Ring works so well is due to its more slow burn approach. I used to really go back and forth with how I felt about this game's replay value. Because unlike the other games, trying to rush through all of the epic main bosses and get to the ending as quickly as possible doesn't work very well. If you want to have as much fun as you can with it on replay, my advice is just to continue taking it slowly. If you feel like you're completely over all of the smaller, less noteworthy foes and only care about the big main battles, then you'll start to feel like there's way too much space between notable landmarks, leading to the feeling of wasting too much time simply riding from place to place on Torrent. Personally, I think one of the best ways to get more out of the game is to appreciate the mini-bosses. Obviously, most of the game's best encounters are the actual big main fights, but shit man, some of the mini-bosses are actually really well made. I'm gonna touch on this more later in the video, but one of the most impressive things about this game to me is how there's such a vast number of different enemies and mini-bosses that had a lot of work put into their movesets. Tree Sentinels, Leonine Misbegotten, Godskin Apostles, lots of these things are genuinely on the same level of quality as most of the main bosses in previous games. While you can argue that some of them show up a few too many times, I personally find that there are just so many different ones to the point that I'm often not too bothered by repeating foes, though there are definitely some exceptions. So if you only want to play this game in order to see its highest highs, you're probably going to have a frustrating time. But if you're willing to appreciate the little things, have fun creating your build, and face off against some of the lesser foes here and there, it can still feel fun for a long time. Obviously, I don't think it's perfect, and I'll touch on that a bit later, but I think you'll find yourself consistently enjoying it as long as you continue to find fun in the smaller encounters. But if you are taking your time and you still don't find it enjoyable, then that's okay. This game probably isn't for you. But now that I've given my two cents on why I think the formula works, let's talk more about the world itself. The main way I think Elden Ring combats the issue of a mundane-feeling open world is the way its regions are set up. Limgrave is a damn near perfect starting area. There's a lot of fun early game fights in it, along with a few noteworthy enemy group encounters, and I think it does an amazing job at introducing you to the gameplay loop. Plus, it's where you find the optional elevator that takes you down to Siofra River, introducing you to the game's underground. The visuals here are generally pretty tame, just some regular grassy fields and forests, but I like how things start off looking simple, because it really throws you for a loop when you start to see what the rest of the world has to offer. I'll I'll never forget the first time I walked into Kaelid. Suddenly the whole bright and fun atmosphere you've experienced so far gets turned on its head when you make your way into this disgusting, oppressive wasteland. I love how this place is such a meme for being so out of pocket and unexpected. I also like how its purpose is to be a completely optional section, mostly centered around leveling up and finding some helpful items in the early game. You can explore nearly the entire place before even stepping foot into Stormvale Castle. I just wish it had a few more worthwhile locations in it. After completing Stormvale, the game's first proper legacy dungeon, you find yourself in my personal favorite region of the game, Liurnia. I think this place is without a doubt where the game's exploration shines the brightest. If you're playing as a sorcerer, Liurnia is like a giant treasure trove of super cool shit to find. The first time I tried this game with a dedicated intelligence build, I spent so many hours in this region trying to find as many spells and memory stones as possible, and enjoyed pretty much every second of it. Raya Lucaria is also a super fitting legacy dungeon. Plus, this is also where you begin Ronnie's quest line, which leads to some of the coolest moments moments in the game, like discovering Nokron and Noxtella in the underground. It even has this guy in it. Marika's tits.
Who the fuck starts a conversation like that? I just sat down. Following Lyurnia comes Alta's Plateau and Mount Gelmir. While Altus doesn't have too many gameplay factors that make it stand out compared to the other regions, the main path is generally a lot of fun. And visually, I think it looks awesome. It does a great job at really making it feel like you've achieved something by reaching it. Plus, it's hard to ignore the fact that it houses the most common choice for the best legacy dungeon in the game, Lanedell. While Mount Gelmir isn't really a personal favorite of mine, I still like its different, more vertical approach compared to some others, and it does a surprisingly great job at hiding the majority of volcanoes manner. While it's nothing crazy, it's got a few secrets and cool sections hidden within it. Unfortunately, the last major region of the game is also probably the worst one. Visually, I think Mountaintops of the Giants is great, and I actually really enjoy going through Castle Soul. But almost every enemy type in this place is something you've seen before. This feels like the point in the game where most players are likely going to stop exploring as much as they can. Fortunately, while this section is a bit disappointing, I still tend to look forward to the end games since it has two more cool legacy dungeons and most of the top tier bosses. Not all regions are created equal, and the game's exploration definitely shines a lot more in the first half, but I still think the continuously changing environments do a lot to make your progression through the world feel satisfying. Plus, I love how there are sometimes multiple ways to progress from one region to the next. Like, you can either get to Liurnia by making your way through Stormvale, or just sneaking around with the side path. And you can get to Altus Plateau by activating the Grand Lift, going through the cave, or taking the secret path through a side section of the Volcano Manor which you reach by getting abducted in Raya Lucaria. These different methods of progressing through the game add up to being one of the major aspects that help each playthrough feel distinct from one another. Even so, while I do really like a lot of the regions as a whole, you could honestly make an argument that all of them should be at least a bit smaller. Despite me defending Elden Ring's replay value earlier, I'm not gonna die on a hill trying to argue that the world is perfect. Every region has a fair amount of the similar ruin sections and open plains that honestly don't do them any favors aside from housing useful items. I do enjoy occasionally fighting enemy camps, and some of the small castles here and there are actually kinda neat, but for the most part, I feel like a lot of that stuff should have just stayed in Limgrave and Liurnia, where it actually felt pretty cool. Most of the best encounters outside of legacy dungeons tend to be unique buildings like the Karian Study Hall that you get to explore upside down. That was genuinely a really cool gimmick. But I guess there's a certain elephant in the room I have yet to mention. The caves. Similarly to the small castles and stuff, the caves actually felt pretty cool in the early game. But by the time you make it about two-thirds through, I'd say most people, myself included, tend to stop actively seeking them out. While there are some that actually have really cool layouts, a lot of them are not very interesting, and by a certain point, you'll realize that most of the bosses in them are either just shitty, or something you've already seen a million times. Personally, I don't have as much of a hate boner for them as some others do, since they're completely optional, but in retrospect, they definitely could have used more time in the oven. These days, I usually only visit caves if I'm trying to get smithing stones, a bell bearing, or occasionally a fun mini-boss. So while I don't have too much against the cave, they don't really come close to competing with actual legacy dungeons. Speaking of which, it wouldn't be a proper FromSoft game without some top-tier level design. The legacy dungeons are basically like this game's replacement for the typical areas found in previous games. And partially thanks to the new jump mechanic I mentioned earlier, I think Elden Ring has one of, if not the, most solid lineup of areas in the series. Sekiro and Bloodborne may be a tad more consistent, but the highest highs here are more impressive than anything we've seen in the previous games. Stormvale is a perfect intro level. Raya Lucaria is an awesome location with great visuals, lots of secrets, and some fun rooftop sections. Volcano Manor is probably the best lava area they've ever made. Elfvale is a cool as hell city with a really unique layout. Faramazula is an outstanding dragon-centered area with peak exploration. And Lanedell is a literal dream come true. It's like they took the idea of all the beautiful epic cities they've made in the past, but finally went the extra mile by letting us explore every inch of it, as opposed to just having most of it relegated to the background. There are so many layers and secret rooms hidden in these places, to the point where it's honestly a little overwhelming at times. Landell even has the entire subterranean shunning grounds area beneath it, which is a super intricately designed labyrinth in its own right. Plus, the simple existence of the game's underground areas is just so peak. When you really start to add up the immense amount of shit packed into these locations, I think it makes the drawbacks of the open landscapes seem pretty insignificant in the grand scheme. Now, before wrapping up the 
discussion of the world, let's talk about the NPC quest lines. I think Elden Ring might have the best new lineup of characters in the series. Blythe, Alexander, Ronnie, Sir Gideon, Muriel, Thea, Hugh, and Sorceress Selen, who they for some reason decided to make hot even though we'd never see her face in-game. I'd say this new cast stands strong alongside the iconic characters of Dark Souls 1. And for the most part, the quests themselves are pretty solid, with Ronnie's in particular being a strong contender for the best one in the entire series. However, if I'm being real, I think the way FromSoft handles their quests is starting to feel a little outdated. In previous games, I'd say they generally fit pretty well within their worlds, but personally, I didn't have a very smooth experience keeping up with the quests on my first playthrough. I find that the massive size of the world in this game sometimes makes it a little too difficult to realistically keep track of all the different characters, each going on their own separate journeys. So while I do enjoy the quests in this game and find a lot of the characters to be charming, I'm honestly hoping that this is one of the main things FromSoft tries to make a little more convenient in their games going forward. Now, just to recap, I think Elden Ring's world is great for the most part. The continuously changing environments help with the feeling of progression. The legacy dungeons contain some of the best level design FromSoft has made, and the cast of characters found throughout stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best in previous games. The most consistent issue I have with the world is just the immense size of it. I think if every region aside from Limgrave was reduced by about 20-30%, to and there were a few less repeat bosses, then it could have been damn near perfect. But as it is, I still think the transition into open-world souls was pretty solid, and definitely could have been handled a lot worse. Now, with that out of the way, let's talk about my personal favorite aspect of Elden Ring. While I think this game excels in a lot of ways, if I had to pick one reason for why I still have motivation to keep playing it, I'd have to go with the build variety. The sheer amount of cool shit that you're capable of using is astronomical. Over 300 weapons, 70 sorceries, 101 incantations, and 91 ashes of war. It's so beautiful. And because of how much stuff there is, it means that any type of stat investment can be worthwhile, whether you're going for strength, Dex, Intelligence, Faith, Arcane, or any kind of mix between two, there's something that's gonna work great for you. But of course, the sheer amount of tools in the game wouldn't be as cool as it is without considering the changes FromSoft made to the formula. Due to the addition of Ashes of War, and just a general bigger emphasis on weapon skills, this is the first FromSoft game where it feels really convenient to have a particularly powerful build while also looking hella cool in the process. They definitely had the right idea in Dark Souls 3, but due to most weapons of similar classes having the exact same skill, weapons with actual cool and unique ones were very few and far between. Which is why I can't praise the Ashes of War system enough. Do you feel comfortable with using a certain weapon, but you're also disappointed with its boring moveset? Here, why don't you just give it this epic looking attack that's also super useful? Whenever you're using a non-infusible type of weapon, you're basically just given the freedom of messing around with a bunch of these moves. But of course, most of the best skills tend to come from the weapons with actual exclusive ones, and luckily there are a plethora of them. There's the Bolt of Grand Sax, which lets you smite bitches from an immense distance, Wing of Estelle giving you an awesome AoE attack, Blasphemous Blade which creates giant waves of fire while simultaneously healing you, Morgoth's Cursed Sword, Death's Poker, Moon Veil, Mogwin's Sacred Spear, Dark Moon Great Sword, Marika's Hammer, Sword of Night and Flame. There are so many unique tools that are genuinely viable while also looking straight out of the final final battle of a hundred plus episode shonen. You could argue that the emphasis on weapon skills is not exactly the most balanced meta for a game, but assuming that FromSoft's goal was for us to have as much fun as possible, I think it was the perfect direction to take melee builds. Plus, we got a few more additions with this game such as jumping attacks and bringing power stancing back from Dark Souls 2. After seeing the return of it, I feel like it should continue to be a staple in their games going forward. Honestly, I don't see why they didn't include it in Dark Souls 3. Dual wielding massive weapons when no person in real life would even be able to hold one of them is something everybody should experience. But now, 
it's time to stop putting this off. We've got to discuss the spell variety. Throughout my time as a fan of the Souls games, I've typically not been a huge advocate of the mage playstyle. I used to try it maybe like two or three times a year, and usually just ended up getting bored or wishing I had stuck to a melee build. But Elden Ring damn near flipped the script. I sometimes find this game more enjoyable as a spellcaster, partially due to the nature of being able to use any spell you've acquired at any time. As much as I praised the hell out of this game's focus on weapon skills, at the end of the day, each weapon can only have one skill at a time. While some of them are insanely cool, you'll most likely get a little tired if you're using the same one for the majority of a playthrough. But with spells, you can acquire up to 12 slots to equip all of your fun moves at the same time. And luckily, as I alluded to earlier, the spell variety in this game is just so much fun to mess around with that I never get bored of it. Let's start with the sorceries. These games have come a long way from just endlessly spamming blue balls. Well, I guess in a way they haven't, but still, the sorceries are a lot of fun. I know that Dark Souls 2 and 3 is where the magic attacks started to actually be particularly cool and have a fair amount of variety, but Elden Ring is on another level. One of the main reasons I find them so enjoyable is because of the larger emphasis this game puts on melee spells. Karian Slicer is available super early game and is arguably better than most of the fast swinging weapons you can find. Gavel of Hyma is a great poise breaking tool that also just feels incredible to use. And Adula's Moonblade might be my favorite spell in the game. I don't know why, but for some reason I just think that conjuring weapons is one of the coolest things ever. Outside of the melee spells, I also love getting my money's worth out of Terra Magica and dishing out tons of damage before aggroing an enemy. Plus, if you get the right setup, you can abuse it with Comet Azura to completely cheese the game in some cases. Don't feel like fighting Moog? No stress, man. You can just melt his health bar before he even gets close to you. Just to mention a few other favorites, there's also Rock Sling, a great early game tool. Loretta's Great Bow, which looks hella cool and works nicely for sniping dudes before they notice you. Thop's Barrier, which can make certain attacks a joke. Gravity Well, with its ability to pull enemies off of ledges. Zamor Ice Storm, a spell that can make you practically untouchable against lesser foes and feels kind of like you're using the upgraded Ice Staff from Origins. Meteorite of Estelle, which is another Comet Azur type high cost, high damage tool, and a bunch of others. Ultimately, my biggest issue with sorceries is that the most practical tool for a situation is often a pretty boring one, but as long as you aren't always trying to use the most perfectly optimal strat, I think it can be a lot of fun. Though as much as I love trying to fit the whole vibe of wizards and staves, I gotta admit that I think incantations are cooler overall. It's like some dude at FromSoft just said, yo, what if we combined miracles and pyromancies to make one ultimate spell type? And that's exactly what they did. The amount of variety with these spells is admittedly a little redundant at times, but overall just a ton of fun. There are so many cool fire spells like Flame Fall Upon Them, Giant's Flame Take Thee, and the beautiful Burno Flame. Or of course, you could also just be boringly overpowered by using Catch Flame, the incantation version of Karian Slicer. And naturally, there's plenty of cool lightning spells like Ancient Dragon's Lightning Strike or Lanciax's Glaive, which I do wish was a little more effective. But let's not forget that there's also the whole subsection of this spell type called Dragon Communion Incantation where you get to summon dragon heads or other dragon parts to use their abilities, which is utterly ridiculous and also just insanely cool. Some other standouts for me are Stone of Garank, allowing you to endlessly chuck rocks at dudes, Black Blade, which perfectly rides the fine line of being viable while also super fun to use, Black Flame, an awesome choice for early to mid game along with the Godslayer seal, and Placidus Axe's Ruin, which may just be the coolest move FromSoft has ever given us. Like, imagine showing an average Faith user in Demon Souls 15 years ago that they'd eventually be able to do shit like this. <laughs> Plus, 
Plus, this is all without mentioning that incantations get access to countless support spells, which just serve to make the game even easier for Faith users. If there were just a few more melee incantations, then they would literally be perfect in my eyes. Another reason I find spellcasting builds to be so fun is because I think they make the game's exploration way more satisfying. If you're going out of your way to find as many fun spells as you can and acquire as many memory stones as possible for those spell slots, then you're given a lot more incentive to thoroughly explore the world. Seriously, if you're in a situation where you want to replay this game but feel like you're tired of it, I would highly recommend doing a spellcaster playthrough if you haven't before. All in all, Elden Ring's build variety is a thing of beauty. It's enough to make a grown man cry. No matter what playstyle you're into, you've got plenty of options that are worth the investment and also just super fun to use. Plus, I love that this game continues the trend in some previous Souls titles of actually being able to use everything you lay your eyes on. You like Radon's armor set? Well, good news, you can also wear it. You think Rinala's moon spell looks awesome? Go ahead, it's all yours. Like the style of Malekith's black blade? Just take it, bro. And when you combine this with the new walking mausoleums, which allow you to duplicate boss remembrances, along with the easy ability to respec your stats, the freedom of what you can use is so liberating. Even if you're someone who's not really into open world games, I would still recommend Elden Ring as long as you have any interest in just using cool-ass weapons or wanting to be a wizard or whatever. In a way, I'd say that Bloodborne's build variety is kind of in the same ballpark, since I prefer the quality over quantity approach that they took with the weapons, but when it comes to the sheer amount of tools at your disposal, Elden Ring is obviously unmatched. And now that I've praised the hell out of this game's variety, let's talk more about the things you fight. Well, here's where we march into controversial territory. The quality of enemies and bosses in this game has been one of, if not the, most polarizing and heated topic ever discussed within this community. I even made my own cringy-ass video about it back in the day. However, now that this game has been out for over two years and the dust has kind of settled, I think a lot of us have learned to accept Elden Ring's new style of bosses. But first, let's talk about the smaller foes like enemies and mini-bosses. When discussing single target fights, I think Elden Ring, for the most part, nails it. One of my favorite things about this game is how FromSoft managed to cook up such a large sandbox of fun combatants to face off against. Similarly to Sekiro, it has that awesome feeling of looking back at some of their older games and realizing that a ton of the regular enemies here have more complex movesets than most of the main bosses in previous titles. And even more embarrassingly, some of the enemies also have more impressive spectacle than previous bosses. I'll never forget the first time I saw one of this game's massive massive golems roaming about. Another fun example that I often think about is the regularity of dragon fights. Back in Demon's Souls, you could tell that they wanted to have cool dragon fights, but simply didn't have the technology for it yet. And in Dark Souls 1, the fact that they managed to make a single, genuinely well put together dragon boss was considered to be a pants pissing, mind blowing achievement. But now in Elden Ring, fighting a dragon isn't even considered to be a big deal anymore. Some of them are just regular enemies. Overall, I think that Tree Sentinels, Crucible Knights, Godskin Apostles, Bloodhound Knights, Magma Worms, Commander Nile, Falling Star Beasts, Blackblade Kindreds, and more are all great mini-bosses. Obviously, there are some stupid boring ones here and there, like Crystallions, and the amount of times you refight the same bosses can start to feel a bit redundant. But personally, I think the game has enough variety for things to usually stay interesting enough. However, there's no way I can defend one of the game's biggest drawbacks, being the gank fights. When it comes to all of Elden Ring's redundant and commonly spouted flaws, this is the main one that I 100% agree with. And it's not that FromSoft is incapable of making good duo or even trio fights. We've seen them do it before. The reason why they're so shitty in this game is pretty blatant. They needed more bosses to fill all of the game's caves with. So instead of making new fights, they just took pre-existing ones and stuck them in a room together without any consideration for how well their attacks synchronize with one another. This led to some truly horrendous battles that honestly feel a little embarrassing coming from a modern FromSoftware title. 
God skin duo really is as bad as people say it is. Going into that fight unprepared is like walking through the gates of hell. Similarly to the world, I think the overall boss quality could have turned out a lot more clean if they just brought the game's scale down by about 20%. But now, let's talk about the actual main Chad bosses, the ones that drop remembrances. Lots of people write them off as being trash due to some of their unfun gimmicks, and others consider this to be the best lineup of FromSoft bosses to date. If I'm being real, I think this is the one subject within this video where I've honestly just gotta tap out. I don't think I can really make a solid argument one way or the other. Personally, I love most of this game's main bosses, but I also admit that some of them come with a few moves or tricks up their sleeve that add a bit of unnecessary frustration. It seems like they felt the need to add a few of these over the top moves and whatnot in order to combat people easily cheesing the game with spirit summons or just some good ol' overleveling. I love Malekith, but his health draining ability seems a bit over the top. I love Melania, but her ability to heal whenever she hits you and Waterfowl Dance are kinda bullshit. I love Radagon, but Elden Beast exists. So if you want to argue that this game's bosses are complete bullshit, and break the rules, then go ahead. But I honestly think they're great overall, despite being a little rough around the edges at times. The biggest difference between the bosses in this game and the previous Souls titles is that they don't give you as many guaranteed windows to attack, and they generally require the player to put in a little more work in terms of spacing. The best example of this would probably be Morgoth. I used to be absolutely shit at fighting this guy, but once I got used to all of his different follow-ups and methods for punishing you, I now can consider him to be one of the most mechanically satisfying bouts in a Souls game. The only thing I really have against this new design philosophy is that I think it makes learning the fights a little too punishing on new players. But once you get them down, they undeniably have some of the highest highs in the series. Plus, a lot of them are solid contenders for the best looking bosses FromSoft has ever made. Rykard is a Bloodborne level boss in terms of sheer grotesqueness, Malekith is an awesome reference to Guts wearing the Berserker armor, Melania's design is so badass, with or without the armor. Everyone loves Radon for his chadliness and gravity powers, and even Elden Beast, despite sucking, looks super cool and surreal. Of course, the music is also really good. I don't think I'd say that Elden Ring has the best soundtrack in the series, but it's about on par with the super high standard they've been keeping up for a while now. The only major gripe I really have with the main bosses is that I just wish there were more of them. If you only count Remembrance bosses as the game's main fights, then that means there's a grand total of 15, giving it the smallest lineup in the series to date. Obviously, this is one of those issues that will inevitably be fixed by the DLC, but as it stands right now, I do wish the game had a few more big, epic battles. So, as a whole, I think Elden Ring generally has pretty damn good enemy and boss design. The field bosses and the ones you find in caves are very hit or miss, but there's still a lot of fun and well-made movesets to find in the mix. Plus, the main fights usually do their job of going about as hard as you'd expect them to, rivaling many of the best ones they've ever concocted. But of course, the FromSoft games just wouldn't be the same without their iconic method of storytelling. Personally, I think my favorite game they've made in terms of story will likely always be Bloodborne, just because the premise is so interesting compared to the rest. But after fully getting into what the Lands Between of Elden Ring has to offer, I think it's become a solid second place for me. Now, I'll just be upfront and admit that I'm not the type of player who actively goes out of my way to try and figure out the lore all by myself with methods like reading item descriptions, or getting every possible line of dialogue out of the NPCs. I enjoy talking to the characters and learning what I can in the process, but whenever I complete one of these games for the first time, that's usually my cue to grab some food and just sit back while I let Ol' Vati explain everything to me in rigorous detail. But from my point of view, one of the biggest advantages that this game has over the others is just the immense scale of it. I know that some of the lore hunters in the community don't like this, since it means that it takes a fair amount longer to get a general picture of the overall history compared to something like the Dark Souls games. But I think the fact that there are so many different factions and important characters does a lot to make the world feel more believable and lived in. 
In a way, it kind of feels like the culmination of lots of different elements found in the lore of their other games. It has godlike creatures in it, similarly to Bloodborne. It has the idea of ages coming and going, like in Dark Souls 1, Dark Souls 3, and Sekiro, along with there being tales of ancient wars between different species, like Dark Souls 2. But one of the main things that really brings it to life, in my opinion, is that the story of the Lands Between feels just a little more involved than most of the other games. Don't get me wrong, I still really appreciate the more subtle approach of something like Dark Souls 1, but I just love how Elden Ring actually allows you to witness and have conversations with a fair amount of the most important characters in this world. Even the ones who you face as boss fights just come off as a little more engaging. Once again, no offense to Dark Souls 1, I love the shit out of that game, but one of my biggest disappointments with it is that I honestly felt almost nothing when coming face to face with the old lords. I know that by that point they were just husks of their former selves, but it didn't feel like we got any semblance of personality or grandeur from them. In comparison, Elden Ring's demigods are a way more memorable group of powerful characters. Melania is a super cool, undefeated badass who feels sorrow for her brother. Radon is a memorable as hell chad of a warrior who infamously learned gravity magic in order to continue riding his favorite horse without crushing him. Ronnie has a great story about wanting to defy the two fingers despite being being chosen as an Empyrean. Moog is also interesting for defying the Golden Order, despite doing some really messed up shit. And Godric is like that one ghost from Adventure Time. My life is like a fart. I just love how this game generally gives us more of everything. For example, most of the big boss cutscenes can still be relatively subtle, but they also tend to be noticeably longer than the ones in previous games. Long enough for Morgoth to give a short speech about how the rest of the demigods are traitors, or for Melania to talk about how badly she misses Mikola. There are also so many different interesting things going on within this world, such as the influence of the Two Fingers and the Golden Order, the ideals of those who oppose the Erd Tree, such as the residents of Volcano Manor, the formless mother giving power to the blood of omens, whatever the hell is going on with moons in this universe, or Mikola's Halig Tree serving as a place of respite for all beings. While these games will always have some parts of the story that are up to speculation, I personally find that the sheer amount of concrete facts given to us in Elden Ring allows it to hold my attention and interest more consistently than any of the others, except Bloodborne. But I think I'll leave my thoughts on it there, since if I were to keep going, then this would just turn into an explanation video. And if that's really what you want, I'd recommend starting with these two videos by Vati, and then just go wherever you want from there. People have made countless videos about finding secrets or crafting theories. So now that I've laid out my major thoughts on Elden Ring's base game, I'd like to take this opportunity to discuss my final big hopes for the DLC. Some of these ideas are definitely way less likely to appear than others, but while we're still living in a pre-Shadow of the Erd Tree world, it's fun to imagine what new features FromSoft has been cooking over these last two years. Number one, a boss rush or boss arena mode. Like I've said before, I love this game's main boss lineup, but the biggest downside to them is that you have to make your way through an entire open world experience just to replay them. When stacking Elden Ring against the other FromSoft games, I really think that this issue is one of the main things holding it back from greater heights. The ability to jump right into a new game and reface all of the combatants that I enjoy fighting so much is one of my favorite things about these games. And it's not like they're oblivious to this concept or anything. We we know that they've thought of it since they literally added a boss rush mode to Sekiro, even though that game is probably the easiest one to run through the bosses of. So while I'm probably going to love the DLC, regardless of whether or not they include this feature, it would be a real nice surprise if they decided to add it. Number 2, Less Open Space While we know that this DLC is going to be massive in terms of overall layout, I'm really hoping that they can find a way to make it feel less redundant than the main game on replay. Judging by some shots we've seen in the trailer, and information given by Miyazaki himself, it's been made clear that the more open nature of this game is not going to be ditched. 
However, from what he said, it also sounds like they experimented with having a more seamless connection between the open areas and legacy dungeons. While it's a little hard to imagine what this will look like, it sounds like a promising direction for them to go in. While I'm obviously really looking forward to some top tier level design in the legacy dungeons, I also think it would be awesome to see them fill up the world with more cool side areas like the Karian study hall. Number 3, Innovation with the Boss Fights I don't have a single doubt in my mind that this DLC will bring us some of the most fun and complex boss battles FromSoft has ever cooked up. But that being said, I would really like to see them try some new experimental ideas with these fights. For the most part, bosses in Elden Ring's main game kinda just feel like slightly evolved Dark Souls 3 fights with the limited attack windows and the player's ability to jump. But Malekith is the one fight that feels to me like a whole new method of approaching their bosses. The way he flies around and hangs on the sides of pillars along with raining his projectiles down on you. I guess it's hard for me to really come up with any specific ideas for this particular wish, but I just think it would be awesome if they found ways to make some of these new bosses feel different than what we've seen before. Of course, there's only so much you can do with the rolling and jumping system, but they may have a few new tricks up their sleeve. Number 4, more information about Queen Marika. Obviously, adding such a massive expansion to the game is going to come with a treasure trove of new lore to be discovered. And personally, I just really want to know more about Marika. Not just because she's hot, but because I want to get more of an idea behind her mindset and what she actually thinks about the greater will. Also, why the hell she would choose to sleep in this bed? This shit looks hard as a rock. And finally, number 5, dual weapon skills. This one is definitely reaching the furthest, but I think if FromSoft added some kind of feature that allowed you to put multiple Ashes of War on the same weapon at once, it would add a lot of freedom to the combat. Finding a proper way to balance this could potentially be troublesome, and maybe it's not as realistic of an idea as I think it is. But having the ability to switch between different weapon arts on the fly without having to use multiple weapons just sounds awesome to me. Aside from these ideas, the main features I'm looking forward to are just things that we know we'll get anyway, like new weapons, new spells, and more poison swamps, naturally. So, as I've said before, while Elden Ring isn't quite my favorite FromSoft game, I still have an immense amount of appreciation for it. Not just because it's really fun, but also because of how its insane level of popularity has helped to shine more light on my favorite series of games. Since the release of it, I feel like this franchise has exploded in relevance, which is fun to see. With its cool world and exploration capturing so many people's attention, it really feels like the Dark Souls 1 of this generation. It has such a perfect mix of nerdy RPG shit to get into, while also just being a really cool action game. At the end of the day, my biggest issue with the game really is just how bloated it is. If they could have brought back the scale ever so slightly, then I would have way less problems with it. And I admit that I also don't see it as much as a perfectly satisfying challenge compared to some of their other games due to the emphasis on weapon skills and a few more bullshit moments than Dark Souls 3, Bloodborne, and Sekiro. But it's still a mostly clean experience outside of the gank fights, and it just has the advantage of being such a massive sandbox of cool soul stuff to mess around with. Tons of awesome weapons, spells, and bosses with really fun movesets. While the game isn't always reaching its highest highs, those peak moments are still up there with the best content FromSoft has given us. And of course, the DLC hasn't even come out yet. We still haven't truly seen the full scope of this game, and I can't wait for the day that we finally get to finish this epic adventure. I'm so hyped to use whatever the new martial arts abilities are. Just look at that. This looks like so much fun to use. Anyway, that's it for this video. Considering that most of you seemed really on board with me making more long-form content in the comments of the last video, I figured this would be a fun idea. And luckily it was. Once again, let me know if you guys want to see more long videos like this one, and if so, I can try to make it more of a regular thing. Until next time.